Uh, good morning, folks. Instructor Gaynor here. We're going to be doing uh, what I will call uh, social contract ethics or contractarianism uh, part one. And again, we're discussing Russ Schaefer Landau's account found in the book, The Fundamentals of Ethics. Now, one of the, th and I'm, I'm admittedly jumping ahead just a tiny little bit in the chapter. I wanted to start out by talking about the starting assumptions of those who advocate for social contract ethics. Now, <clears throat> two important figures to point out that are mentioned in the text, and we discussed this before. When we were discussing psychological egoism earlier in the course, I had made reference to a, to a story out of Plato's Republic well known as the Ring of Gyges. Now the gist of that story is every man, you know, a regular Joe Sixpack might behave well when he is under the coercion of threat of punishment. Because after all, all of us by nature are self-interested. We want to get the best out of life for ourselves and those who we care about. Most of us abide by the rules for this reason because of the threat of punishment, not because we believe it's the right thing to do. What happens to the man in this story when he gets a hold of a ring of power that enables him to become invisible? Well, he does whatever he can get away with to maximize what he wants out of life. He commits regicide. He takes over. And Glaucon in this story asks, well, which of you wouldn't use the ring in some similar way? And you're, you know, you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't in arguing with him. Because even if you would say that you would use the ring for good, he would come back and say, well, you're still using it in your self-interest. Because you perhaps might just want to say, hey, I'm God here. I can do whatever I want. I can shape a world in my own image. And by the way, if you didn't use the ring in nefarious ways, he would say you're just too darn scared of getting caught. Now, this is sort of the ancient world's Exhibit A arguing for psychological egoism. The more modern account arguing for psychological egoism, and I have this in the notes, it's also in the text, comes from the British 17th century philosopher, Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes is well known for taking a position, and this is the way his critics put it. He presents a bestial account of the human condition. And by bestial account, what I mean is simply this. We are basically rational animals. And just like the rest of the animals, we are in a brute struggle to survive. We are in a brute struggle to survive. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a second before I talk about what the author calls proceduralism. In order to argue his position in favor of a social contract, in his book, The Biathon, which is the excerpt uh, in The Ethical Life, He asks us to consider a hypothetical scenario that is famously called the state of nature. Now, folks, in the state of nature, there is no rule of law, no civil society. It's what we sometimes call the law of the forest. You know, the strongest will survive. Don't turn your back too long because some animal might be there to get you. In other words, it is a scenario where there is a brute struggle to survive. Now, I want to help some of you out with the theoretical backing, because in part, a discussion of this will explain why so many of us look at social and political issues in the way that we do. It actually comes straight out of Thomas Hobbes. This is a phrase the author of the text does not discuss. But I want you to have a deeper understanding of it. 
many of you folks have heard of what is called the natural rights tradition? The natural rights tradition will come out of this time period of Thomas Hobbes. What the natural rights tradition says is this. In the state of nature, human beings are radically what? We are radically free. Why? Because we are individuals and there are no powers keeping us from doing what we want to do. Now folks, what he argues is that this condition of being radically free in the state of nature is ultimately an, an untenable one. And this is because in the state of nature where there is no rule of law, it is a brutal struggle of each against everyone else. As a matter of fact, he calls the state of nature a, like a state of war. Each individual in a brute struggle for survival. Now folks, the most popular image in literature, and the author even mentions this, that sort of typifies this idea, is Lord of the Flies. Punchline, decent British school children in their decent British school uniforms, if thrown out in the state of nature, trying to survive, they will resort to the law of the forest too and begin to behave, I guess, badly for lack of a better way of putting it. Now let me give you guys a couple more examples. There haven't been many good caveman movies made. For some, perhaps some of you movie addiction on would know what I'm talking about. One of my favorites, which is actually a good one, it got a thumbs up back in the day from both Cisco and Ebert. It was called The Quest for Fire from 1979. There was no dialogue in this film. Now there's one scene that for me sort of typifies the state of nature. And I actually used this way back when, when I was a tutor back in college. You know, this example hasn't gone away from me. A cave woman bends down at a brook to take a drink. Now keep in mind, there's no rule of law here. This is going to be slightly graphic. In other words, I might trigger somebody. And if I do, I apologize. In not too short of order, a caveman comes up from behind her and he goes caveman on her. Now keep in mind, without the rule of law, you can't say what about anything. But raping is wrong! Well, guess what? Right and wrong, according to this account, are social inventions. In other words, without civil society, not only would we have no need for morality, but this so-called thing called morality wouldn't exist. Your judgment of it being wrong, you know, has to do with your own subjective and emotional attachments to these things. But in the state of nature, it's the law of the forest. Survival of the fittest, kill or be killed. Now it turns out that caveman that went caveman on her gets told shot by another caveman. And guess what caveman number two does? The same thing as caveman number one. Now, folks, I could give you plenty of other cinematic and fictional depictions of this. In a sense, this is what zombie movies are all about. You know, what happens when civil society breaks down? You've probably seen or heard of 28 Days Later, correct? I mean, that's the kind of film that certainly depicts what I'm, what I'm talking about. Or even, if, and this isn't even a zombie movie. If any of you heard of, of the film Shadow Grave, it was one of the earlier films that Ewan McGregor was in. But yeah, what happens when the, when the contract among friends breaks down? They're ready to go at one another's throats. I won't give any spoilers in case you haven't seen in the film and might be interested uh, in seeing it. Long-winded point made, I hope. That what Hobbes is calling the state of nature is something that no rational being 
would actually want to be in. Because as Hobbes famously put it, in the state of nature, minus civil society, life would be nasty, brutish, solitary, and short. This is why we enter into the social contract rationally. Not because we want to, but because rationally speaking, our long-term self-interest depends upon it. Part of, and the author doesn't get into this because there's only so much time in the context of a survey course. But one of the reasons why Hobbes was so iconoclastic is because he turned a fundamental assumption about human nature on its head. Traditionally, the medieval Christian world tended to hold the viewpoint that we came together out of mutual love. Hobbes' view actually turns that on his head. He says, no, we come together and form social contracts out of mutual fear and distrust of one another. Now, admittedly, you know, just about anyone is going to admit this is a fairly grim position on human nature. But simply because it's grim does not make it wrong. Doesn't make it right either. But simply because it's a grim account of human nature it doesn't make it wrong. Now, one thing that I like about this grim account is that it paints a worst case scenario about human beings and human nature. And then it argues that even given a worst case scenario, we can still argue that there is a reason to be moral. Even under a worst case scenario, there is an argument to be made that human beings ought to be moral and not to be too blunt about this. The rationale for your being moral is because there's something in it for you. Your long-term self-interest will actually be gained by your submitting to the social contract and obeying the rules and obeying the rules. Now, I mention this, there's a famous line, and you've probably heard this before. According to this Hobbesian model, we give up some of our natural freedom. In other words, we give up some of our rights to do whatever we please to do for the security of civil society. We give up some of our rights. We don't give up what? We don't give up all of our rights. And the debate among social contractarians is not unlike our socio-political debates today. The extent to which our rights ought to be given up for our collective greater good. And unsurprisingly, people disagree about this. In other words, how much of our natural rights do we need to give up for the greater good? And by the way, everybody who holds their own particular positions on this believes that they are on the side of true rationality. And they believe that their opponents are the ones who are being irrational and stupid. Now, I've sort of explained a little bit as to why, even within a supposedly rational social contract, there will be disagreements. There will be back and forth. There will be conversation about the extent of the social contract and as to what constitutes rational and fair laws. Now, why does the author of the text refer to social contract ethics? as a form of proceduralism. Now, I'll give you the short answer. It is because that instead of assuming from the get-go that certain things are inherently right or certain things are inherently wrong, in other words, we come at the question of what's right and wrong with a clear mind, making no assumptions. So instead of making assumptions, proceduralism Ask the question, 
Is there a rational decision procedure that we ought to go through to determine what is moral and what is immoral and why? And guess what? Social contract ethics gives us this kind of a decision procedure. Now, the fundamental assumptions about human beings, just to reiterate, are I should have said this second that even though we are animals, part of our fundamental nature is our capacity for rationality. We have the capacity to think meaningfully and critically about things. Now, the other assumption of social contract ethics is that we are self-interested. In other words, it accepts the premise that psychological egoism defines that which motivates us. Now, what it contends is that because we are self-interested, but we are also rational, we can see the rationality behind Hobbes' argument that we actually have a vested interest in doing what? Entering into a social contract. That we have a vested interest in doing so. Now, we won't be able to talk all about social contractarianism today, but I will talk about what the author calls some of its advantages. First and foremost, and this is one of mine, not the author's, it makes minimal assumptions about human nature. And what I mean by that is this. It assumes the absolute worst about us, rather than having an optimistic view about human nature. And it's still able to justify, you know, a reason why we ought to be moral. And ultimately is because being moral is in our long-term self-interest, according to this view. Two, it explains morality as a social phenomenon. This may turn out to be a problematic thing down the road, by the way. I'll talk about that later. Some of us believe, not necessarily me, that morality is and always was a human construct. Something that we invented in order to make our lives among one another more livable. Because guess what, folks? We do not live alone on a desert island. And I guess to harken back to something I didn't fully address, in order to illustrate this need for cooperation, the author of the text appealed to something called, and by the way, it's one of the most simple constructions in what's called game theory. Call a prisoner's dilemma. So Chuck and Curly are bank robbers. They have set successfully pulled off a heist. And guess what? They know that they've done it perfectly. They've left no evidence. But somehow or another, they are both independently picked up. And of course, they are individually interrogated with the whole good cop, bad cop scenario. And of course, the good cop will offer them both independently a plea deal if they do what? Yeah, if they rat on the other guy. Now keep this in mind. And this is, now here he goes. <clears throat> and, uh, in one circumstances, in one circumstance, Suppose that he rats on his friend. Now guess what will happen to him? He will get a lesser sentence, but his friend will have the book thrown at him. Now suppose that he remains silent. As a friend of mine growing up once said, if you ever get picked up for anything, deny everything. Because why? 
The burden of proof is on them, not on you. Now, if both of the men remain silent, and if they are sure that there was no actual evidence against them, the best maximized situation would be if they both remain silent, and they have the potential of both going free. Now, keep in mind, if they're in competition with one another, guess what they're both going to do? They're both going to rat on one another, and they're both going to do time. Now, if one of the men rats and the other one doesn't, it's kind of like playing chicken. Then one of them is going to be screwed. But yes, in a sense, both of them will be. Now, it turns out that the maximal self-interested situation here wouldn't be for both men to rat one another out. The maximal situation would be for both men to do what? Yeah, to cooperate with one another, to remain mum. And guess how they would figure this out? And I did, I'll admit, I didn't like do the full-blown uh, chart here. Basically, to perform a rational calculation about which scenario will maximize their possible situation. Now, of course, each man's remaining silent is only beneficial for him if what happens? Yeah, if the other guy remains silent, too. So in other words, there has to be a, a sort of attitude of, of mutual cooperation if both men wants to maximize his situation. Now keep in mind, this turns a lot of our conventional economic assumptions on their head too. Most of us have been taught from the cradle how awesome capitalism is because why? Because through competition, group struggle, the, cre the economic cream will rise to the top. Well, guess what? We end up with a whole lot of shopping malls closed as a result. We have a whole lot of, you know, vacant shops and things of this nature because CBS decides to set up across the street from Rite Aid and compete with one another. When the least social waste would actually be what? For there to be fewer companies with fixed prices. It's starting to sound like a damn commie, I guess. <laughs> right? But yeah, think of all of the social waste that actually is caused by competition. The thing is, if we were to cooperate more, perhaps our overall maximum could be achieved, or at least we could minimize the worst case scenario. Maximizing the minimum is how John Rawls of Harvard puts it. Now we are about out of time here. I'm going to continue next time by discussing more of these advantages, and then we will talk about some of the challenges to social contract ethics. I also want to talk about the updated version of the social contract model from John Rawls next time. Cheers.